Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 24th of September and it's a quick look a week at the week ahead beginning the 27th of September with me, Michael Houston. It's certainly been a bit of a strange week. Um, we've seen quite a bit of volatility, quite a bit of movement, but we haven't really gone anywhere. It's all been in the confines of the ranges that we've been in for pretty much the last three to four or three to six months. <laughs> I think that for me, I think just highlights how uncertain investors are about the outlook for markets in general. Um, we started off the week very much on the back foot, um, falling sharply with the FTSE 100, falling all the way back virtually to 6,800 um, before rebounding quite strongly Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. And, you know, I'm struggling a little bit to sort of really make sense of the moves this week because, you know, concerns about Evergrande are nothing new. They've been bubbling under the surface for quite some time. Um, certainly there's nothing new about supply chain constraints. There's been nothing new about rising energy prices. Um, so for markets to be freaking out on Monday and then Evergrande makes a loan payment on Tuesday and then misses a bond payment on Thursday, God, that sounds like a Craig David song. Um, we're not really any further forward in terms of whether or not Evergrande is going to make those bond payments than we were at the beginning of the week. And yet markets have done a pretty decent round robin tour of the overall range. Um, so what does that mean going forward? Well, I think it's going to be more of the same, if I'm honest. If I look at the price action with respect to the FTSE 100, that did its best to reprise its role as a perennial party pooper yesterday um, by sliding back from its intraday highs to finish in negative territory. Um, we're also seeing a little bit of weakness today, but if we actually look at the FTSE 100 over the week, it looks set to be a fairly positive week, which makes a pleasant change. But, you know, are we any further forward in terms of a directional um, indicator than we were a week ago? Not really. So brings us to brings us to the S&P 500. Again, we broke below the 50 day moving average, um, which has helped to support um, pretty much the move over the course of the past 12 months. Um, and despite brief forays below it, once again, we are now, um, or we now appear to be trying to move back above it. I do have some concerns, however, with respect to this move in US markets, because we did take out the previous lows. We took out these lows through here, and these lows through here. And even though we have recovered back above them, I'd be more confident of further gains if we were able to take out 4,500 in terms of a momentum play, um, which would give me then greater confidence that we'll move up towards 4,600. Certainly, I think in the wider scheme of things, um, nothing really much has changed in terms of the overall outlook. Yes, the Fed has become an awful lot more, but not, not an awful lot more hawkish. I think they pretty much signaled their intention that they were going to tilt towards a taper um, at their latest meeting, and they've certainly done that. The number of FOMC members who saw the potential for a rate rise in 2022 um, increased from seven in June to nine um, this month. So certainly it wouldn't take much more for there to be a majority for a 2022 rate hike, always assuming, of course, that we get a decent September payrolls report. So there's an awful lot hanging on the September payrolls report on October the 8th. And one thing that did strike me from the press conference on Wednesday was that if progress continues broadly as expected, the committee judges a moderation in the place of asset purchases may soon be warranted, which means we could get an announcement in November um, with potential, a potential start in December. Um, some people are arguing that we might get a start in November. 
I mean, yeah, we might, but that only leaves one payrolls report between now and then because the Fed meets on the 3rd of November, two days before the October payrolls report. And I think, to my mind, yes, they will want to taper, but I, I still think that they'll probably want to see how the November the 5th payrolls report for October plays out first. Uh, another thing that did strike me was that Powell said that an even half decent report could be the final piece of the jigsaw for tapering to start in November. So how do you define half decent? 400,000, 500,000, um, less than that. Would, would, a, would another 235 be considered a half decent report? You know, and I think that phraseology, half decent, may be doing an awful lot of heavy lifting if we get if we get a disappointing report. It's unlikely given the weekly jobless claims numbers that we've we've been seeing, but you can never rule anything out. And in any case, um, one of the things that we did notice this week is obviously bond yields shifted higher as a consequence of that US um, Fed meeting. Uh, the 10 years now back above 1.4%, first time it's been above there since July. So certainly I think the narrative has shifted to um, concerns about inflation, the Bank of England also indicated that it was concerned about the direction of travel for inflation. And as a consequence of that, we've seen UK guilt yields spike. And I'll show you a chart about that just after I've shown you this, this DAX chart. It's quite interesting that this DAX chart here, okay, it did break this line here, but what it didn't do was take out those lows there. And we managed to hold above the 200 day moving average. So let's just quickly draw in horizontal line through there. Which I'm just about to do. There we go. So that 15,000 level now becomes a very sort of key line in the sand, I think, for me when it comes to DAX support, that and the 200 day moving average. But once again, we didn't really break out of the ranges that we've been in over the course of the past few months. And what was, I think, particularly notable is that while um, European markets and US markets were rebounding from the lows, the K225 was pulling back from significant resistance levels around about 30,700. So not much correlation going on there, apart from the fact that it's still stuck in it, still stuck in its range. So um, I think we can pretty much expect to see more of the same over the course of the next few days and weeks. In terms of the dollar, um, seen a little bit of a pullback in the dollar over the course of the past couple of days. Again, that tapering announcement was pretty much priced in um, to a certain extent, and markets appear to be fairly comfortable with it, certainly if you look at what bond yields are doing and what some equity markets are doing. At the moment, they appear to be going, or yesterday they were going in the same direction, yields were going up and markets were going up. How long that can continue remains to be seen, but certainly I think in the context of the moves higher in the dollar, what we've seen here is a continuation of the broader range that we've been in over the course of the past few weeks. So let's move on to this really sharp, sh sharp shift in sentiment that we saw um, from the Bank of England this week, much more concerned about inflation. And you can certainly see that borne out in five-year gilt yields. Um, that's the move higher on Thursday. If we look at that on the two-year, we've also seen the two-year move sharply higher as well to their highest levels um, since before the pandemic. I mean, that's quite a sharp rise in borrowing costs since the beginning of August. We've gone pretty much from 0.05% to 0.4% in the space of three months. So markets are increasingly pricing in the prospect of a rate rise from the Bank of England sometime over the course of the next 12 months. On the 10-year yields, the, even here we've seen um, a slight move to the upside. We've taken out the previous highs to be trading at the highest levels that we've seen pretty much in the last couple of years. If I change that to a two-year chart, we, we can see that we haven't quite got above the peaks there, but if we look at, say, for example, um, the two-year, the rise in borrowing costs is much is much more noticeable um, at the shorter end of the curve or, or the or the yield there. 
So that's um, that's UK borrowing costs. What we haven't seen though is a significant similar rise in the value of the pound. That continues to remain a little bit on the soft side. We saw a little bit of a rebound there. That could potentially be a bullish reversal on the sterling index. I uh, might have to redraw that line there because I didn't draw it correctly through that point there. But, but certainly in the context of these series of lows through here, we do have a decent area of support all the way through there. So you can see that around the 1000 level on the CMC sterling index. So again, it looks it looks increasingly like um, a continuation of the range trade that we've been in um, for several several weeks and months now. So that's sort of looking back at the last week or so. Some good news came from last week. Obviously, UK US transatlantic routes are due to reopen on the 4th of November. That's given the airline sector a decent boost this week. IAG, British Airways, up over 15% on the week. Um, that certainly will be welcome. Rolls-Royce has also done very well. Um, and certainly it's, it's a welcome boost for the travel and leisure sector. Unfortunately, it could be running into a cost of living crisis with energy prices and what have you. Um, concern about that, fuel shortages at the pumps because of a shortage of tanker drivers. But there does appear to be some evidence that natural gas prices are starting to top out. We appear to hit a peak on Monday, and these are Dutch natural gas prices, and they are now starting to slip back a little. So maybe, maybe whisper it quietly, um, the worst is behind us in terms of the gas prices. The big question now is whether or not we see shortages of supply over the winter months. Let's hope not. For someone who remembers the winter of discontent in 1979, let's hope not. Anyway, as we look ahead to the coming week, um, the, the main items on the menu are revisions or final revisions of UK second quarter GDP, US second quarter GDP. We've got flash CPI from the European Union on the 1st of October on Friday. So that will give us an indication as to whether or not the reading of 3% that we saw in August has gone up or whether or not um, that was just base effects pushing that up and we're actually going to come in a little bit lower. Um, over the course of uh, the last month or so. Um, certainly in terms of what else we've got coming out in the week ahead, we've also got um, US PCE as well. Um, and that is expected to remain unchanged at around about 3.6%. Now that is the Fed's preferred measure for inflation, core PCE, Deflator, as I say, that should that should come in around about 3.6%. 3. 3. We also have University of Michigan sentiment as well. Um, so looking looking at the CPI number, that is expected, or it's estimated to come in at 3.3%, a rise from 3 to 3.3%, um, so, which again will obviously have the hawks at the ECB champing at the bit. Um, one of the notable things of the past week or so is the, e the ECB. Um, it's not in any hurry to talk about um, moving on interest rates. Yet core CPI, when you when you strip out everything else, core CPI is still below 2%. And it's only expected to rise from 1.6 to 1.8%. So there's a big difference between EU core CPI prices and headline. CPI prices. And I think the governing council will probably hide behind that. Certainly once the German election is out of the way um, due this weekend, we can probably expect to um, sit through three to six months of navel gazing amongst German politicians as they try and cobble together some form of coalition. And the likelihood is that it will be a three-way affair. The favourite outcome at the moment or the electoral mass in terms of the booking or the betting office odds, is it'll be a three-way affair with the FDP, the Greens, and the SPD. Um, so that will be very interesting to see who compromises on what. 
when it comes to coming to a coalition. And I think given the wide differences in terms of policy, um, we could find that the, the government could well be um, a fairly fragile affair. We'll have to wait and see as to whether or not um, we get a, we get a quick agreement. If anything, if it's anything like 2017, we could be waiting until after Christmas. But as I say, we'll have to wait and see. So the results for that um, should be due out late Sunday night, early Monday morning. What does that mean for the euro? Well, to be quite honest, I think when you're talking about macro, when you're talking about macro considerations in terms of the euro, I'd much rather look at the charts. And at the moment, in terms of what the charts are telling me, is that we are pretty much at the lower end of the recent range. There's decent support at around about 116.60, here or hereabouts. What we saw yesterday was a potential bullish reversal which suggests that we could see a little bit of euro strength and a little bit of dollar weakness over the course of the next few days and weeks. Um, and as such, we could see a continuation of the range that we've been in over the course of the past two to three months. So fairly well supported in and around these sorts of levels here and resistance up here. I really don't see any reason to change that overall narrative when it comes to euro dollar. What does that mean for cable? It's pretty much the same here, looking at this chart. We can see fairly solid support in and around 135.70, 136. That 136 level held yesterday. And again, we saw a very strong bullish reversal on the cable. Now we could drift back to around about 136.70, um, but as long as we hold above 136, then I think the, remains, the, the range will remain intact, easy for me to say. But that's what the charts are telling me until such times as we get a break below that low, then really, I think that's really the sensible way to play it. You know, you play the price as it is, not as you would like it to be. And at the moment, we've got fairly decent support in and around these series of lows, not only on euro dollar around 116.60, 117, but around 135.70 and 136 on cable. Until that situation changes, um, then it's unwise to try and um, Get, try and jump on the back of a break of that range, um, you know, just based on just based on previous price history. Looking at euro sterling again, pretty much same old, same old. Toppy above 86.10, fairly well supported around about 84.80, 85.90, and that is essentially where you where we are. You pay your money, you take your choice. So that is euro sterling. In terms of Brent crude. We are now pushing back up against those previous peaks all the way back in July. Decent chance we could get towards $80 a barrel, but at the moment, while this level here is capped, um, then again, I think it's likely that we'll find decent support in and around this $66, $65 a barrel and $78, $79 a barrel here. I don't think that um, we will want to see prices much above that in the short to medium term. Certainly not while we're heading into winter, but certainly the bias does appear to be to be towards a slightly firmer uh, commodity price. Gold has obviously taken a bit of a hosing on the back of that of the of the um, potential inflation concerns and rate rise concerns. Not especially so. We're down two weeks in a row. Seem to be stabilising. Those are the flash crash lows all the way back in August. We quickly recovered off that which suggests to me there's fairly decent demand for gold in and around $1,700 an ounce if we actually get down that far. In terms of the outlook for this week, over and above the GDP numbers that we've got for UK and the US on the 30th of September, not really expecting to see much in the way of revisions for either of those two numbers, um, certainly in terms of the, the UK, 4.8% was the, was the uh, number for Q2, not really expecting to see much of a revision in that number, may see a slight revision higher, maybe 4.9 perhaps, um, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's really neither here nor there. Um, in terms of US GDP, we might see a nominal revision here, higher here as well, from 6.6 .6 to 6.7%, but again, you know, it's, it's likely to be nominal 
that best. We've got manufacturing PMIs on Friday. Um, we already know from flash numbers that they've been slightly softer. Supply chain constraints are pushing input costs up, um, potentially driving um, consumer prices higher and certainly consumer confidence in the UK and pretty much across Europe is starting to fall back over concerns that things are about to get an awful lot more expensive. On the earnings front, there's only two items to really that have really caught my eye. Next being one of them. When when Next last reported in July, um, the, the shares finished today sharply higher, um, down to the fact that um, I hate it when the chart does that. It'll come back in in a minute. Um, there we go. You can see that you see when it reported in July, we've we've made margin, we've almost retested the record highs, which suggests to me that maybe an awful lot of the good news is priced in. Um, first half numbers, um, Q2 outperformance, sales guidance for the year was raised from 3% to 6% growth. Given recent events, I can't help thinking that's optimistic. We also saw Nike and FedEx this week issued profit warnings or lower their guidance on concerns over supply chain constraints. So um, that could be a factor in next, next first half numbers. Um, however, I mean, and Next did announce it reached a deal with Gap in the US to manage the US firm's online business. But then again, that doesn't start till next year. So that's not likely to have much of an effect, but certainly they raised pro full year profit guidance by 30 million, 750 million. So we'll have to wait and see whether or not um, they are as optimistic over the course of the second half of the year, um, given current concerns about supply chains. We've also got Boohoo. Um, certainly Boohoo has been one of those that's uh, been struggling in recent months. And we can see that borne out from this chart here. Got fairly decent support in and around 250, 250p. Um, this is again first half numbers for Boohoo. Um, shares are currently down over 25% year to date. So I think an awful lot of the news or the bad news could well be priced in. We'll have to wait and see. On the plus side, they have announced a deal with Al Shire Group in the Middle East, which will see Boohoo brands in Debenham stores in the Middle East, across the region um, as well. So there could be a boost there. Um, management did warn, though, that 2021 was going to be a more cautious year in terms of the outlook, with sales growth predicted to slow to 25%. So um, again, I think this will be more about the outlook than about current trading. So keep an eye on that um, 250p level on Boohoo shares going forward. So I think that's pretty much it for this week. Once again, thank you very much for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you all have a great weekend, a restful weekend, and I will speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thank you very much.